The Bible is very clear in describing the world of unbelievers. In Ephesians 2.1, it says they are dead in trespasses and sins, and they are children of wrath. Ephesians 4 says, they live in the futility of their mind, darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the hardness of their heart. Our Lord Jesus said about people outside His kingdom, they do not know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Our Lord Jesus said in John chapter 3 that they love darkness rather than light. They are doing evil, hating the light, not coming to the light for fear their deeds will be exposed. Jesus further said in the eighth chapter of John that unbelievers do not understand divine truth. They are unable to hear the words of our Lord. They do not believe. In Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul says, the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. It does not subject itself to the law of God. It is not even able to do so, and it cannot please God. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 1.18 that even the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the cross, is foolishness to those who are perishing. In his second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 4, Paul said the gospel is veiled to those who are perishing. They are blinded in their minds by Satan. This is the divine diagnosis of the human condition, cut off from the life of God and headed toward eternal darkness. That condition is summed up perhaps as well as anywhere in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let me read you a few verses. A natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that He will instruct Him? But we have the mind of Christ. The natural man understands not the things of God, but those who are in Christ have His mind. We understand the mysteries of the kingdom. We don't expect the world to understand us. We don't expect the world to understand how important, how essential how singularly important the church is that proclaims the only message that can turn people from sin to God and from hell to heaven. The Bible tells us the world will not understand that. The Christian gospel, Christianity itself, is not really comprehensible to all who are in Satan's kingdom. We cannot expect them to understand the church, the Bible, the gospel. We can, cannot expect them to grasp the reality of Christian life and fellowship and worship. We can't expect that they would know that Christianity is not a set of rules, it's not a set of ethics, it's not a list of moral behaviors or spiritual ideas or charitable thoughts. It is the worship of the true God and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. True Christians believe in and love and worship and serve the Son of God, and we confess Him as our Lord and Savior, the only Lord and Savior. Sinners must come to Him to be delivered from their sin and judgment. But the gospel is not acceptable to the fallen mind. 
blinded by fallenness, blinded by the love of sin, blinded by the darkness imposed by Satan. The gospel and all it contains does not seem rational or acceptable. We believe in a God who became a man. We believe the eternal God who died by dying provided eternal life to those who were dead. We believe in a king who became a slave. We believe in a sovereign who exchanged the crown of glory in heaven for a crown of thorns on earth. We believe in a righteous judge who became a criminal, a holy God who became the sinner's defender. We believe in a just executioner of sinners who became their savior by taking their execution. Christians believe in a holy law which provides complete freedom, a joyous freedom which is slavery to righteousness. Christians believe in a kingdom on earth with a capital in heaven. Christians believe in a little flock of innumerable saints. Christians believe they are wretched outcasts who became saints. They are enemies who became sons. They are slaves who became kings. They are poor who became wealthy. They are bankrupt souls who are given eternal riches. They are rebels who became friends. They are haters who became lovers and even lovers of those who hate them. Christians believe they are victims who became victors. They are strong who rejoice in their weakness. They are the despised who receive honor. They are souls who die once but live twice. They are mortals who become immortal. They are corrupt who become incorruptible. They are the sorrowful who have eternal joy. And all of these realities have come to us because the giver of life gave up his life so that those dead in sin would live forever. The glory of the gospel escapes the mind of natural man. But we have the mind of Christ. These are the truths in which we rejoice and for which we worship. We're different. Jesus put it this way, my kingdom is not of this world. We're in the world. We're not of the world. We have a king and a Lord, and His name is Jesus Christ. And Scripture is crystal clear as to how we are to submit to our Lord. In Romans chapter 10, familiar words, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Salvation comes to those who confess Jesus as Lord. What does it mean to say that Jesus is Lord? Well, for one thing mentioned in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, maybe easily overlooked. It says in verse 5, we are destroying speculations, ideologies, ideas, philosophies, and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. We are in this world to take the truth to destroy the lies. Any lie lifted up against the true knowledge of God. And here's what it means to acknowledge Jesus as Lord. We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. To say that Jesus is Lord is to take everything, starting with your thoughts and your deeds as well, captive to the obedience of Christ. We obey Christ. We love Christ. We lovingly and gladly obey Him. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 9 
For this reason also, because of his death and resurrection, God highly exalted him, that is, Christ, bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God highly exalted Christ and demanded that every conscious being in the universe bow the knee to Him as Lord. Back to Ephesians for just a moment, chapter 1. Here is the Apostle's prayer for us. Verse 15. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. This is the Apostle Paul praying for the church. And what are you praying for? That the God, verse 17, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of His might, which He brought about in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age but also in the one to come. And He put all things in subjection under His feet and gave Him as head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. Paul's prayer for us is that we would be enlightened to understand what it is to be a Christian. And what it is to be a Christian is to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come.